so much, Cassie and uh, Sarah. What a wonderful, wonderful start to the service. We appreciate you both. We want to welcome everyone who's joining us today as uh, we gather for this graduation Sunday as we celebrate all those uh, young people within our church and community who are uh, coming to the end of high school and uh, anticipating high school graduations and prom, uh, which is coming up. And for those university and college grads who've completed their programs and are excited for the next chapter in life, uh, we want to celebrate you today. Um, just a few quick uh, announcements before we begin the service. Um, you have probably picked up a bulletin on your way in, and you can see in the bulletin a number of things coming up in the life of our church. Um, you'll notice that um, uh, for many of you, I'm sure have uh, known already through the internet that uh, Paula Oakley passed away. And uh, we certainly think of all of her family and uh, her kids, her grandkids, her great grandkids. Um, there's a lot of people who are uh, grieving um, Paula even now, and we want to come around that family. Um, right now, they're looking at having a celebration of life service in October when distant relatives can be here. So that won't be right away, but please don't uh, forget the, the, the family of Paula Oakley. And uh, we didn't get a chance to send it out um, before this morning, but we wanted to let you know that uh, many of you have been praying for Meryl uh, Wenzel, and, uh, and uh, Meryl passed away. And so we want to be thinking of Ethel and for all of the kids, and uh, for Gina and Nancy and uh, for Grace and uh, for Mitchell. Um, there's going to be a funeral service here at Bridgewater Baptist on this Thursday. That's at 2 o'clock. And I believe our, uh, the, the kitchen committee are going to be helping with a, just a, a sweet and uh, um, fruit uh, reception. And so you may get a call from the kitchen committee who are, are looking for people to help provide some sweets to be a part of that reception as we remember and celebrate Merrill's life. Um, there's a number of things in the bulletin. I hope you have a chance to take a look at them and to be a part of what's going on in the life of our church and in this community. Today we have a potluck. Now we don't, we haven't had potlucks with COVID, so that's a big thing. Yeah, it's worth, I heard a hand, yeah, a potluck. And uh, it's a barbecue. We want to thank the Christian Education uh, and Action Committee who are organizing today's uh, barbecue potluck. Immediately after the service, I'm going to say grace right here in the sanctuary, and Allie is gonna come up at the end, and Allie is gonna give us, Allie Lowe, uh, just a few instructions uh, so that we can go directly out and uh, get our uh, barbecue and all the goodies that have been laid out on the table, and just enjoy a bit of fellowship before you slip off for the afternoon. Um, you, everyone is welcome. Whether or not you brought anything for the potluck, everyone is welcome to stay after the church uh, and uh, to be a part of that time together. Um, I want to also draw your attention to the yard sale. Um, our Board of Finance shared the announcement that's in the back of your bulletin. Just thanking everyone who has volunteered and been a part of the organization and the, uh, all of the labeling and all of the work of carrying things that was a part of the yard sale. Um, together with all of your efforts, $7,000 have been put towards the church mortgage, uh, which will, in the long run, yes. will knock even another uh, $2,500 off in interest in addition to that. So uh, well done. I know it was a lot of work and, uh, and a great opportunity to be visible and to connect with people in the community. And so a big thank you, especially to Wally Grant and all those who are part of organizing our church yard sale. There's a number of people who are visiting today and folks who've uh, made it back. And, and so we're excited. I know some of you have seen uh, Tim and Lisa shoot. They're here, all the way from Vietnam, and so welcome to the shoots. And uh, Adrian and Nicole Gardner, and uh, certainly their kids, Elijah and Grace, are here. We want to welcome them as they made their way from Ontario. I mean, there's such a party going on at the lake, I'm told there's even a boat floating on the bottom, right? And, and <laughs> So great to have them here, and uh, we want to welcome guests uh, Mark and Heather Carter, uh, Owen, Wyatt, and Ben. Welcome to Carters who are with us this morning as well. I'm just going to invite you to stand and turn to the people who are around you and greet them this morning. If you see someone you don't know, please go and introduce yourself, and we're going to begin the service in just a moment.
Okay, now behave, behave. Once again, we want to welcome you to worship this Sunday at Bridgewater Baptist Church. A special welcome to everyone joining us over YouTube and Facebook, and for those who are joining us over CKBW Radio and our local church broadcast, 98.7 FM in Bridgewater and area. Uh, we're glad that you can be with us uh, this Sunday as we continue worshiping the Lord together and giving him thanks for all his good things. Christ is enough for me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that today we gather in the name of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, who came into earth in the humility of a babe, to be with us, God with us in the flesh, and to know all of the joys and the sorrows, the anticipation and the temptation of what it means to be human. And that Jesus, you came and lived an exemplar life. You lived a life that was a part of the kingdom of God, God's will and way in the world. And God, you call us by your power and by the presence of your Holy Spirit to enter into that life. God, I thank you for the graduates who are expecting the next chapter is the change that is coming into their lives as they look forward to new jobs or new education, new relationships. The future, Lord, is so filled with possibilities. But ultimately, Lord, we know that you call us into a future with you. And we thank you that your story already has a conclusion and that you're there at the end of history calling us forward into the fullness and the abundance of life made possible in Jesus Christ our Savior. For it is in his name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our first uh, song of faith, Christ is Enough for Me. Yeah. 
few weeks we've had a lot of surprise visitors. If you remember some of you, the uh, uh, wonderful surprise to have um, Brian and uh, Roseanne uh, show up a few weeks ago, the MacArthur's, and then last week Tom and, and Nancy uh, Harvey who came back from Virginia. And so this week I was talking to Eric Campbell and Eric and Sharon said, we want to visit too. And uh, well, they weren't actually able to get flights to come down to be here today from Wyoming, Ontario, but they did send us a little video. Hey everybody, I just want to say greetings from myself and from Sharon too. We'll put her on a little later as she'll consent to this video, but I wanted to show you some context here. I'm at Wyoming Baptist right now as a transitional pastor. Jesse has taken this for me, one of the guys who got baptized, baptized just yesterday. Just uh, past year during COVID, so uh, we're still about Jesus here, and what can I say? So we're going to take a little tour in here, and uh, walk with me into the <laughs> church, and I'll show you where we're at, and uh, we're having a good time, it's quite exciting here, like I said, Jesse was one of three who got baptized during COVID, and uh, the church seems to be growing, and God's good, so... Here it is, founded in 1997, uh, here is a building, but actually 1879. Uh, so come on in with me. Yeah, typical, we come in the church and need to turn on the lights. just give some context uh, to to the situation we're in we're living right now actually on a family farm just a few miles from the church and really enjoying that and this ministry has been really good uh, uh, lots of health things come and go but on the whole we're very good here like I say we'll let Sharon speak for that later. But I did want to bring greetings, especially when I hear others have been there, but a special shout out to the grads. And some of you, I know you guys, and we did last week, uh, handed out some big brownies with sparklers on them to our grads as well. So congratulations to all of you, and uh, congratulations to you as a church too. It's been years and years of great ministry. So God bless you, and I will catch up again with Sharon. Eric and uh, Sharon, the video actually broke, and so we weren't able to get the full. So, but for those who know Sharon and uh, Eric, they send their greetings. And so we may have a part two video coming from Sharon, because she didn't get to say her piece. But uh, just so glad to see that they're doing well, and they certainly want to extend their love to you as a congregation. Uh, every year there are graduates in the families and in the congregation here at Bridgewater Baptist who uh, we want to celebrate and uh, we've seen many of these young people grow up and we've seen what God's been doing in their lives and so there are four graduates this year and unfortunately none of them are actually here today uh, so we have regrets from uh, uh, um, our graduates who are working or who are traveling right now but each one of them have been reached out and I know that we're, we'll be presenting them a gift on behalf of the church. So congratulations to Caleb Mitchell, who is graduating from the Atlantic Police Academy in August after completing on-the-job training this summer at Bridgewater. So if you're speeding in town, you might get stopped by Caleb. <laughs> Caleb is also continuing in a part-time criminology degree at Sir, uh, Sir uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. And so we're so proud of Caleb Mitchell. <laughs> congratulations, Mom and Dad, as well. Uh, congratulations to Mary Beth Freeman, and uh, we're so excited to see what God's doing in Mary Beth's life. She's graduating from the Nova Scotia Community College with Practical Nursing Diploma, and we're excited to see where God is going to do next in Mary Beth's life. 
Congratulations to our son. Uh, Eric and I are very proud of our son, Tristan Kenny, who's just graduated from Mount St. Vincent University in a BA in communications and with distinction. And uh, Tristan's actually camping right now in Cape Breton, but he sends his love to all of you. And we're excited to see what happens next in Tristan's life. Finally, Daniela Casera has been a young person we have just wondered, wonderful to see grow and blossom as she's uh, come up through our church. Daniela is uh, graduating from Parkfer Parkview Educational Center from high school, and she'll be attending Acadia University to pursue a Bachelor of Arts in Theater. And she's gonna be working this summer as the program director at Long Lake Camp. Congratulations, Daniela. As a church, we're so proud of all the accomplishments of our graduates, and we want to pray for them. So let's pray together for our graduates. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of children and young people. That, Lord, uh, for some of us, we have the great honor and responsibility of being parents and grandparents. But as a congregation, we share a responsibility to care for and to love and to encourage young people that have been entrusted in your family to grow in their faith and to mature into the young men and women that God you created them to be. We pray for each of these graduates. We pray for them as they make this next move in life, that you would give them wisdom and discernment, that you would place good spiritual friends in their lives who continue to be an example, continue to be an encouragement in their faith. God, we thank you that for each one of these young people as they've received and experienced Jesus in their lives, that, Lord, you will continue working in their lives as you work in all of our lives, calling them forward to grow and to mature into the faith that they are called into. Lord, protect them. We remember last week of the story of the seeds that fall upon the path. For this world would like to choke out our faith. This world would like to distract us and, and draw us away from the full vitality and abundance that comes in Jesus. Oh, so Lord Jesus, we pray your blessing upon these young people. We pray, Lord, that you would just move deeply in their lives and that they would find in you their greatest joy, the joy of salvation. Be with them and bless them, and may you bless the world through them. For we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen.
today, or if this is the first time you've been with us here at Bridgewater Baptist. Uh, this is a series that uh, we're continuing on. Oh, sorry, I unplugged my batteries, David. This is a series that we've been sharing in uh, since the uh, end of May, and it continues on to the first Sunday in July. And we've been receiving over the winter questions from members of the congregation and community about life and faith in the Bible. And so we're trying to answer as many as we can. The number, the list keeps growing, so I know we won't get through them all in this series, but hopefully we'll get to come back again to look at more questions. So today we continue more questions from last week. So glad you asked about the Bible. And I think today we'll only really have time to look at two questions, but they're good questions, I think. So the first question is this. This comes right after last Sunday's message. Great message this morning. Thank you. I've never noticed before how Jesus used parables as something more than a moral lesson. I guess I've been assuming that they were like little fables that Jesus used. Why do you think Christians misread them so often? So thank you so much for the the vulnerability in this question and for being honest, and and it's a good question. Why Why is it so easy to misunderstand parables? And I think last week we we talked about the fact that a parable, what a parable isn't, it isn't a fable, and it isn't an object lesson. Jesus isn't always trying to make things crystal clear with the parable. In fact, he tells us specifically that parables are meant to hide the truth in plain sight, and that some people will hear the parable and they will seek after the truth and they will find it, and others will hear the parable and they will turn away. And many people who follow Jesus struggled so much with his teachings that they did turn away. John's gospel tells us that at a critical time, many of the disciples turned away and no longer followed Jesus because his teaching was so hard. I think another reason that it's easy to misunderstand parables is because of Sunday school. (laughs) Now, I went to Sunday school, but many of you went to Sunday school, and a lot of our understanding from Scripture actually is formed from the music we sing So a lot of our theology, our understanding about God, even our prayer life is very impacted by the music that's a part of our worship services. And the other thing is we're very impacted by those early memories and images of the Bible that we received when we were young. And some of us had very positive experiences of scripture with loving and just interesting and engaged teachers in the Sunday school or catechism or however you might have at a young age started to engage the Bible. But sometimes we get a little lazy, and, we, and one of the things that I think we're tempted to do often when it comes to scripture and children is to turn the Bible stories, and definitely the parables, into little fables, into little moral lessons. Like the, the story of the Good Samaritan becomes be nice to other people, which is not a bad message, but it's missing what's really going on in the story of the Good Samaritan. And as we saw last week in the story of the parable of Jesus of the sower, Um, there's a lot going on inside of the parables that he's teaching. That was an interesting parable last week, the parable of the sower, because it's one of the only times in the Gospels that Jesus takes the disciples aside afterwards and explains to them what he was doing in the parable of the sower. Do you remember that? The two tellings, the first telling where Jesus actually tells the parable of the sower, and then there's this little interlude where he and the disciples are talking about why use parables are so difficult, And then he goes on and he retells the parable of the sower to explain to them. And in that instance, Jesus uses a technique that we often think of as allegory. The seed represents the word of God. And the soil represents the state of people's hearts when they receive it. Do you remember that? That's not news? You remember a bit of that? Well, what's interesting, though, is Jesus, because in this example of a parable, uses an allegory to 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 help us understand what he was doing, some people have assumed, well, then all parables are allegories. In fact, there was a time in church history during the, it's called the patristic period, you know, from about 200 to about 800 years after Jesus, that a lot of the church uh, scholars, if you were to go to the great city of Alexandria or Constantinople, you would find people who came into faith with in in Christianity. They they came to know and have a loving relationship with Jesus. But when they came to the Gospels, they didn't know what to do with them, how to understand them. They They didn't have a Jewish background. 
They didn't understand a lot what was going on. And, and so during that pat patristic period, a lot of people tried to understand the Bible as allegory. And you can read all sorts of church fathers from that period that read the Bible as if it's all an allegory. And um, I don't think the Bible's all an allegory. I think there's a lot more going on in the Bible. But it's like that expression, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, exactly. If all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. What an awful way to live. Could you imagine if, I, if someone said, I need someone to come and build me a home. Oh, there's a carpenter. It's not Aaron Kenny, but there's a carpenter. Come on over and help us build a home. And he shows up and all he has is a hammer. What kind of house is he gonna build? Or if you showed up at the mechanic and he pulled into the bay and the whole garage is pristine, it's clean. You know, there's a little bit of oil and glass on the floor, but don't mind that. And the mechanic comes out and he says, okay, let's take a look at your car. And all he has is a hammer. Or consider going to the dentist. <laughs> and you're sitting in the chair and you're complaining about the pain in your jaw. And the dentist says, nurse, bring me over my hammer. You would get out of there pretty fast. And I think this is a bit of a challenge when it comes to the Bible. That Sometimes we, at a young age, we learn a certain way that this is how we understand the Bible. And that's all, we don't have anything else in our toolbox. And certainly that has been a part of church history. There was a period in church history when you can see that very thing taking place. So if I was to answer this question one way, it might be something like this. Um, in this church, some of my sermons may be unsettling because I want you to see that the Bible is not a nail and interpreting the Bible is not simply a hammer. Those who have ears, let them hear, as Jesus would say. And that can be unsettling because a lot of us, and I don't want to say that there's only one way that we interpret Scripture, but if we have a very limited toolbox and we come to the Scripture and there's only a few ways that we understand how to make understanding out of it, we can, we can actually twist Scripture to fit our tools. Even when we struggle, though, to understand God, even when we make mistakes and try to understand what the Scriptures are telling us, we do believe that God is inspired and God is working through scripture and the Holy Spirit can lead us into truth. And so, fortunately, we're not on our own when it comes to scripture. We have the Holy Spirit to guide us and to be with us. And we have the community of faith that we come to scripture together as people. And what I miss, someone else will hopefully see. So, why do Christians misread the Bible? Well, we're humans, and we sin, and sometimes we see the world and other people and even scripture through the plank in our own eye, as Jesus would tell us. The moment I think that there's nothing new for me to learn in the Bible, that I have it all figured out, that my interpretation is the interpretation of the Bible, that's when we start getting into dangerous territory. And even more dangerous, and probably one of the most insidious things that we as a church constantly need to be aware of, is to the moment that we slip into thinking that we don't interpret the Bible, we just read the Bible. I don't have an interpretation, but this is what the Bible says. And we miss the fact that we've actually, in saying that, are interpreting scripture. Does that make sense? We don't even realize we're doing it, that we take the words of scripture and we interpret it. We're constantly interpreting scripture. That's what we're supposed to do with it. We're supposed to wrestle with it, find its meaning, and see how scripture applies to our lives. And we do it as individuals, and we do it as a community of faith. And that's a good thing. But we're constantly growing in our ability to do that. So I'll give you a fun example for the graduates and for anyone out there who, you know, is connected to the internet. How many of you watch Netflix by yourself? Show of hands, just you can, anyone? Okay, some people watch Netflix by themselves. You know, it's, you can watch Netflix by yourself. And if, and if you don't know what Netflix is, it is a streaming service online. You pay a subscription, and it's full of television shows. And um, if you watch Netflix by yourself, that's fine. You will, Netflix is actually watching you. And sorry, what am I doing? My, okay. <laughs> Eric is itching, and I'm thinking, I'm my, my, my button. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. 
Okay, sorry. So Netflix is watching you, and there's an algorithm that's trying to figure out what you like, and it's going to keep giving you shows that, you know, if you watch an action this day and you want another action movie on Saturday night, it's going to start giving you action movies. That's kind of how it works. And so if you watch Netflix just by yourself, you're going to gravitate to a certain genre or cer certain type of television show. But when you watch Netflix with other people, all of a sudden you start to get exposed to things that you wouldn't necessarily naturally turn to. Like when I watch Netflix with Erica, I get to see these incredible documentaries that I might not have gone out and looked for, but I benefit because of her interest and she benefits from mine. Or if I watch Netflix with my kids, I'm going to get exposed to shows that maybe I would never have looked for, but wow, that is fantastic. But not only will we be exposed to things that we would avoid, we see things that we wouldn't have seen on our own. And this is happening all the time. It even happens in the Bible. That when we see something with other people, they will see things that we're oblivious to. I mean, a simple example of this is the, the show Stranger Things. Now, Stranger Things is, I think, one of the most popular shows that Netflix has produced. And I'm sure there's probably a few Stranger Things fans out there. You don't have to put your hands up. It's kind of like a 1980s nostalgia, kids, goonies, horror show, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But the, 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 the show Stranger Things, it's in its fourth season now, is filled with 1980s nostalgia. Stuff that if my kids were to watch it by themselves, is just going to go right over their heads. I mean, they can still appreciate the show and the characters and the plot, but there's so much in there that they can't possibly see unless they have someone to point it out to them. It's like the two characters, uh, Winona Ryder plays um, uh, Mrs. Byers, it's Joyce Byers, she's a mom in the show, and this guy named uh, David Harbour plays a character, Big Jim Hooper. And here we have them here behind me, you can see Big Jim and, and uh, Joyce Byers. And, and you, maybe from this picture you can tell that there's a bit of tension between these two. She's not a child, she's a mom, she's an adult, he's just really big. <laughs> but all through the show, as, as Joyce, as we watch her character uh, uh, develop, she's watching television. In the 1980s, there's one show she keeps watching. If you watch the show, you'll see it popping up a lot. And our kids wouldn't get the reference, but maybe some of you will. Do anyone recognize Sam and Diane? Cheers, where everyone knows your name, right on. Now, if you, if you, weren't, if you didn't live through the 1980s, you wouldn't know that, that Sam Malone and Diane are the quintessential unrequited love. I mean, they're just, there's so much tension between these two, and they work together, and they see each other every day, and you just want them to be together, but there's just this tension between them all the way through their story. And so if you want to understand Joyce and Big Jim Hooper, well, Stranger Things is giving us this little signal. They're the Sam and the Diane in the story. And if, and if you know that story of Cheers, you get that right away. And then, and then when Jim Hooper wants to impress her and, and, and he pulls out the Hawaiian shirt, I mean, my kids don't get it, but some of you already know who he's trying to be. This is a policeman. He wants to become a detective. He wants to be Magnum P.I. Like, this is, what, this is his dream. Like, my kids don't see it, but it's there in every episode. I mean, if you, if you don't know Magnum P.I., Tom Selleck, he put the macho in mustache. I mean, this guy was just, he was the heartthrob. And, and, and big Jim Hooper, he wants to be Magna P.I. He wants to impress her, and he wants to save the day. I, 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 I'm sure I've told you this before. I had a French teacher in grade 7, Mrs. Johnston, and she had a framed picture of Tom Sullivan on her desk. <laughs> I think she kissed it every morning when she came into the classroom. That's back when mustaches were cool. I mean, they're still cool, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mike. They're still cool. I mean, when I watch Netflix with our kids, I'm, all these little things are firing. I'm making these little connections that they couldn't possibly know. And then as I'm watching Netflix with the kids, I'm brought back in time, and I remember what it was like to go to a roller skate rink 
with your friends in the 80s. Why don't we have more roller skate rinks? Where do they all go? You know, I remember what it was like to go with some friends to Blockbuster Video and to pick out a video that it wasn't just there on your device. You actually had to go to a store and you had to rewind or you weren't kind. That's what it was like back in the 1880s. And when the, and the character Max puts on her Sony Walkman and tunes out all the, the mean kids in school and wants to be by herself, man, I get that. Back before there were iPods or iPhones and you had to put a tape in and use a pencil to, to get it to when it came undone. There's so much going on in Netflix that you actually appreciate when you watch it with other people because they have the context and they see things that we don't see. So why do we not always understand the Bible? Well, we tend to skim over the parts that we don't understand. We, we all tend to do this. We tend to skim over the parts of the Bible that just don't quite mean, seem to make sense to us or we don't think, that can't possibly apply to my life. And then we pick and choose those passages, those dozen passages or 20 passages, or maybe you've got 50 passages. They're the ones that you really focus on, and we kind of ignore everything else. And we assume that in our limited understanding that we, we've got all that God wants to say to us in the Bible. And I think that's why we often misunderstand the Bible. And we are better if we can come together in a Bible study or in a, in a worshiping community like this and continually be saying, God, what new thing do you want to teach me? Because there's a lot more that God wants us to hear in the scriptures. Second question, and this is the last one for today. And this is a question that actually I received way back in the winter and it was supposed to be a part of last week, but it just went on for too long. So this is the last week's question brought forward, but it's another parable. And this is the parable of the unjust steward. It's found in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 15. And, and I, I know some of you are familiar with this parable because I have actually done a sermon on it before. But, you know, of course, not everyone's here every Sunday or we forget the sermons that we hear. But this is such a good and important um, parable to talk about for a number of reasons. So thank you for asking this question, the person who sent it in. The parable goes like this. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Where have we heard that phrase before already in Luke's gospel? Someone who was wasting the possessions. The prodigal son. This story comes after the story of the prodigal son, but here in the story of the prodigal son, we have this man who wasted his father's possessions. The word prodigal, as we were learning last week, means to waste. And even his older brother will say to his father, what about that younger boy who's just waste your, wasted your property? Here we have a story of a rich man who is a manager who is wasting his possessions. We already know a little bit about what Jesus has to say about the one who wastes. It's okay, so let's lean in a bit more. What's the story all about, Jesus? So the rich man calls to him and asks him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be a manager any longer. So as Jesus tells the story, the rich man calls this guy in the carpet and says, what's been going on? I want an account of what you've been doing. You're out of a job. Now, the manager says to himself, says Jesus, what shall I do now? If we want to bring that up, sorry, yeah, maybe it's frozen. The manager says to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, people will welcome, I know what I need to do in order that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. Now he's not talking about being a house guest or having a couch to sleep on. He's talking about getting a job as a manager for somebody else, just to make that clear. I know what I'll do, so when I lose this job, I'll get another job. So he calls each one of the master's debtors, and he asks the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. And the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, let's make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? 
A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill, let's make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. Luke 16, 1 to 8. So the question that I receive goes on and the person says, this parable confuses me. How many of you are with him? <laughs> okay, thanks. This parable confuses me. He goes on and writes, is Jesus condoning this behavior? Does Jesus approve of the under the table transactions? I know you often give insight into what times were like 2,000 years ago. Maybe your insight could ex better explain the parable if we heard it, how the way Jesus would have explained it. Well, thank you. So let's just go on to the, the explanation. Um, I've actually, as I said, I've, I have preached in the church archives. If you want to go back, you probably would find a sermon just about this. But today I want to share with you some things that I've actually learned about this sermon that I didn't know or I didn't observe back when I preached a sermon about it a while ago because we're always learning new things. But first of all, one thing I did share in that original sermon is that during this time when Jesus speaks about rich people, there was already built into that a judgment in the culture. There was a sense in the first century Palestine that you, we lived in a zero-sum world and that if someone was getting rich, someone else had to be getting poor. And that was very common as a worldview within this time in history. And so if someone is rich, they're taking advantage of someone else is the expe expectation. And this is actually playing out in Jesus' own culture. Because we know that in Jerusalem and in Jericho, there was an elite rich class that would make their way up to the Galilee and to the poorer sections of Judea. And they would prey upon poor landowners and farmers and fishermen. As the Romans would raise taxes, they would say, well, we've had a bad year this year. Well, let me give you a loan. And then they would start paying back the loan and maybe they'd have another bad year. And so the rich people would send someone up and say, I know you're having a really hard time. I'll just, I'll double the loan. And then they'd come back and say, you can't pay back the loan. Listen, let me take your farm. Let me take your fishing boat. Let me take your olive garden. You can still live here and do the work, but I get half of everything. And the rich get richer. And then there's another bad year. And they send down their manager and say, you're not meeting your quota. Let's make it 75%. And pretty soon there's a whole class of people who are indentured servants of the rich. And so when Jesus speaks about a rich man, immediately the audience are like, oh, we know who he's talking about. He's talking about the elite living in Jericho and Jerusalem who are taking advantage of the poor. And they are so despised, they won't even show their faces up in Galilee. So they'll send their servants, their, ma their managers, the masters of their houses, to go up and be the debt collectors. But there's a shocking twist in Jesus' story because everyone knows the injustice of what's going on in this system. All of those listening to Jesus know that it's unfair and the rich are getting richer and the poor just seem to be getting poorer and life is getting harder, it's not getting easier. But then Jesus turns the tables in the story because the rich man who's been trying to rip off the poor people is going to get ripped off by his own manager. Don't change the channel. I want to see how this is going to end up. There's a rich man, and he's being taken advantage of by his master of the house, his manager. And the master of the house, as you've already heard the story, does this little deal, and he starts being a little creative in his accounting, we'll say. But then the manager finds out, and he says to him, well done. If I thought I was a good thief, you're a better thief. You are a shrewd manager. Jesus turns the tables in the story. For the people of this world who are shrewd in dealing with their own kind, says Jesus, sorry, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed in your eternal dwellings. Do you get the sarcasm here in the story? Do you get that? You people are so much smarter than the children of the light. 
You people who are exploiting others, you are so wise. But then Jesus turns it around and he gives his real lesson. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. We've heard Jesus do this lesson in the parable of the talents. If you can be trusted with a little, God can trust you with lots. But then Jesus turns that and flips it on his head. But whoever is dishonest with a little will be dishonest with much. If you are unfaithful, if you are cruel, if you misuse what God has given you in a little, in those low-risk situations, what terrible things are you going to do if we entrusted you with the kingdom of God? So, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, how will you be, how, how we, uh, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. You will either hate one or love the other. You will be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And if you haven't already got the lesson of the parable, Luke wants to make it clear. And so he goes on and says, the Pharisees who loved money heard this and they were sneering at Jesus. They got, they got what he was saying in the story. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your heart. What people, what people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Jesus tells this story, and we are to assume that the people who are listening are hearing both sides of it. Jesus is speaking to people who've been exploited, who have been on the wrong end of this economic system. And he's also speaking to people who are playing the game well and who are exploiting others. And Jesus tells a story that kind of flips everything on its head, saying that if you play this game really well and you get yourself really rich in this zero-sum game, that's nothing to be bragging about. If you play this game well and you can get more from, for nothing from other people like you're trying to do, oh, don't be proud, because God detests what you're doing. And you are, could become a person worshiping money, and you've missed the real purpose of life. You're worshiping what you can do to get yourself more when you're supposed to be giving it away. There's something worth mentioning here about this story, and that's that in this parable, the main character is not the hero. And I think sometimes in Sunday school, as we started opening up parables and stories to kids, we tend to, to tell stories from the Bible like they are fables, where the main character is to be admired. That the main character is like, wow, look what they've done, now why don't we do likewise? But often, Jesus does the exact opposite. The main characters in many of his stories, the main characters in much of the Bible, are people who fail, who make mistakes, and we learn from their mistakes. You've probably heard me say many times, the Bible is filled with cautionary tales where God's people learn to not follow into the path of sin that others have fallen into. But there's something else really interesting going on here. And this is the thing that I, when I was sharing this parable the first time, I didn't pick up on. And it's only through study and listening to others that I realized, oh, there's something else going on here. It's like discovering that, you know, big Jim Hooper wants to be Magnum P.I. You know, I'd never noticed it before, but there's this thing that happens in this parable that you don't really find very much in the Bible. Jesus gives us this little inter-monologue, this interior, mon interior talk. We get to hear what's going on inside the mind of the manager. Now, we're used to that. If you read novels, if you watch television shows, you know, today we're just so used to that literary device. But you don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. Nowhere through the parables of the Old Testament will you find a character giving us the inner monologue of what they're thinking and why they're doing what they're doing. And in the New Testament, you don't find that anywhere else either. It's only in the Gospel of Luke and only in seven parables. Seven parables that Luke thought, these are important. They need to be a part of the story of Jesus. God's Spirit leads Luke to include these seven stories in his gospel alone. 
that include these inner monologues. What's interesting is that the inner monologue isn't something that's Jewish. Jesus shares it from pop culture. D during the, 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 this time in history, the Jewish people, are they've just come out underneath the Greek or the Greco-Roman control of the world. When we've talked about this, the, the age of Hellenism. And so the Jews have been trying to protect themselves from Greek culture. They don't want their kids going to the gymnasiums where men exercise naked. And they don't want people to worship the gods that are happening in all these Greek fertility uh, 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 worship shrines. They want to stay away from Greek culture, but it's all around them. And Greek literature and Greek plays and Greek drama was all through the Jewish world hundreds of years before Jesus' birth and even during his time. And it is in Greek drama that we get the introduction of the inner monologue. And you've probably seen this, right, before? A character just looks like they've got everything together. They're just so nice. They're just, everything, everything's going great. And then they turn to the audience and say, I can't stand them. You know what I mean? Like, the, you, you see this person who just seems to be acting so generous, so perfect, so graceful, and then they turn to the audience and they tell you what they're really thinking. That's the inner monologue. And this happens all through Greek culture. This is a part of the pop culture that is going on around Jesus during this time in history. And Jesus tells these seven parables, and he takes that and he uses it. And in each of these seven examples, Jesus gives us a character who he seems to be doing something wise until you find out what's really going on inside his head. And Jesus lets us peek in and see what he's really thinking. And every time Jesus does that in these seven parables, we see someone who's making a big mistake. I'll give you a few examples just really, really quickly. We won't go through all seven. Yeah, maybe we just go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This is the, the parable of the foolish farmer. The foolish farmer is this guy who's been planting, he's been doing everything right, and he has a bumper harvest. He's just got so much food. It's just, his fields are just ripe. This huge bumper harvest. And he kind of says arrogantly to himself, what should I do? I have no place for all my crops. And if you remember the parable of the foolish farmer, when he has this bumper crop, what does he decide to do? In his inner monologue, he's thinking, what do I do? I've got all this food, so much. What does he do? He builds more barns. Exactly. I've got so much, I better build more. I've got so many clothes, I need more closets. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've got so many cars, let's build up more garages. That's the story of the foolish farmer. And Jesus points out that he is a fool because he could have given that food away and alleviated the suffering and the poverty and the hunger around him. But instead, he built more barns. And God will take away everything from him, and his barns will be empty, and he will no longer be there to enjoy them. That's the parable of the foolish farmer. And when Jesus gives that inner monologue, he shows us what's going on in the heart of this man who had an opportunity. God blessed him to do something great in the world. God blessed him with an opportunity to help others. And instead, he wants to fill his own barns. This example also comes out in this parable that we just shared. Again, this manager has this opportunity to come clean. But instead, we get the inner monologue. What will I do now that my master is taking my position away from me? Am I not strong enough to dig? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm too ashamed to beg. And so what does he choose? He chooses to draw other people into his deception. He's been lying. He's been cheating his boss, and now he's going to pull other people into that lie. He chooses the wrong thing. Or another example, Jesus in uh, Luke 18 just bring that up yeah thanks this is the story of the corrupt judge this is the judge who is not just and again and this is again one of these parables in luke where jesus gives us an inner monologue and there's this woman who has been suffering she's been suffering injustice and the judge pays no attention he doesn't care about her at all but she's persistent and she comes again and again and again crying out for justice and he gives her justice and on the outside wow, God must have done something good in his heart. He must be on the right road. But then Jesus gives him the inner monologue. And we read these words. This is the judge who says, 
Though I have no fear of God, and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. Yeah. Jesus is trying to point out in these stories the sin and the brokenness that we all have. These are stories that try to get past the surface and try to get at some of the heart issues that we all struggle with. That when something good happens, and rather than sharing it, we want to keep it for ourselves. That when we get in trouble, we want to draw other people into it as opposed to owning our own mistake. Each of these stories are opportunities for Jesus to take what's going on in the lives of these people and in our lives as well and to expose them in plain sight. These are not fables. The, the Bible is not full of fables that just give us one simple moral les lesson, how to make friends and influence people. That's not what Jesus is doing in the story of the shrewd manager. These are powerful stories that Jesus told, and this on the screen behind me, to confront spiritual brokenness of people. And they are powerful, subversive stories, confrontational stories, to try to lead us into the change that God wants to see in our lives. Jesus, in these stories, is not condoning sin. Because he tells the story of a crook, because he tells the story of a greedy farmer, it doesn't mean that Jesus is saying those actions are okay. No, these are stories that are meant by Jesus to expose our own sin and our own brokenness. And Jesus is calling us to transformation. Because we hear these stories in the context of Jesus' full ministry and the gospel and the good news that we're called to be a part of. We read the stories and the parables of the New Testament because as we come to wrestle with them and understand them, we see ourselves in God's light. As uh, Emmanuel uh, Catonhole writes, we become the people we are because the stories we tell each other. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, um, you're a God who loves us, and you are so patient. Lord, you don't lose patience. You don't just say, okay, I've had enough with these people. But, Lord, you show your long-suffering love that you're willing to come and enter into our brokenness. You're willing to come in the form of a servant, your own son, Jesus Christ, to walk with us and to teach us and to challenge us so that we might become more like you. God, I pray that you would continue to be calling us into living a deeper and fuller relationship with you. I pray this for our graduates. I pray this for everyone. That whether we are nine or 99, each one of us, Lord, you're calling us to continue growing and changing, to taking new steps of faith. Lord, may we do this by the power of your Holy Spirit. For in your name we pray. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite uh, Ali Lowe to come up, and she's going to give us a few instructions in just a moment. As Ali's coming, I just want to remind you that next Sunday, we uh, enter the month of July, and our worship time moves ahead to 10 a.m. instead of 11. And so we welcome you to come and join us next Sunday at 10 a.m. Also a reminder that the funeral for Merrill Wenzel is this coming Thursday at 2 p.m. here at the Bridgewater Baptist Church. Ali's going to give a few instructions, and then I'm going to say grace. And I know that not everyone can stay for lunch. I know people, some have other plans or commitments they have to go, but we want to thank you so much for joining us for worship today. Allie. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but every time there's a food announcement, they send the largest person in the church to make it. I think there's a subliminal message there. I'm just not sure. Anyways, I hope everyone can smell the barbecue going. Um, just where we usually have coffee is where the side dishes are and the sweet table. Uh, there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, a um, drink station set up there. And then just proceed outside. Um, there's a station to fix up your burgers. Uh, the fellas, uh, we have burgers and hot dogs. We have not a lot of hot dogs, but mostly burgers. Uh, there's tables outside. There's tables inside, so just find yourself a comfy spot. And amen to the first barbecue of the year. Let's just say a word of prayer and grace as we give thanks for this time. Dear God, I thank you so much for the joy of fellowship, that we are part of your family. You are our Father. And together, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you are making each of us adopted sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in your wonderful kingdom. Lord, I pray that you just bless our time together. We thank you for all of those who've been joining us online today. We pray your blessing upon them, that they would have a great week ahead. We thank you for all those listening over radio. And for those who are here able to enjoy and partake in this meal, Bless this food. Make us grateful for your good gifts. And Lord, may you bless all of those who have been working and preparing so that we can enjoy this time together. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. Go forth in peace.